Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 124 to 127 Chapter 124 The Needle Next morning the not yet subsided sea rolled in long slow billows of mighty bulk and striving in the Pequod's gurgling track pushed her on like giant's palms outspread the strong, unstaggering breeze abounded so that sky and air seemed vast, outbellying sails. The whole world boomed before the wind. Muffled in the full morning light, the invisible sun was only known by the spread intensity of his place, where his bayonet rays moved on in stacks. Emblazonings as of crowned Babylonian kings and queens reigned over everything, the sea was as a crucible of molten gold that bubblingly leaps with light and heat. Long maintaining an enchanted silence, Ahab stood apart, and every time the teetering ship loweringly pitched down her bowsprit, he turned to eye the bright sun's rays produced ahead, and when she profoundly settled by the stern, he turned behind and saw the sun's rearward place, and how the same yellow rays were blending with his undeviating wake. Ha! Ha! My ship! Thou mightest well be taken now for the sea-chariot of the sun! Ho! Ho! All ye nations before my prow! I bring the sun to ye! Yoke on the further billows! Hello! A tandem, I drive the sea. But suddenly, reined back by some counterthought, he hurried towards the helm, huskily demanding how the ship was heading. East sou east, sir, said the frightened steersman. Thou liest, smiting him with his clenched fist, heading east at this hour in the morning, and the sun astern. Upon this, every soul was confounded for the phenomenon just then observed by Ahab had unaccountably escaped every one else, but its very blinding palpableness must have been the cause. Thrusting his head halfway into the binnacle, Ahab caught one glimpse of the compasses. His uplifted arm slowly fell. For a moment he almost seemed to stagger. Standing behind him, Starbuck looked, and lo, the two compasses pointed east and the Pequod was as infallibly going west. But ere the first wild alarm could get out abroad among the crew, the old man, with a rigid laugh, exclaimed, I have it. It has happened before. Mr. Starbuck, last night's thunder turned our compasses, that's all. Thou hast before now heard of such a thing, I take it. Aye, but never before has it happened to me, sir said the pale mate, gloomily. Here it must needs be said that accidents like this have, in more than one case, occurred to ships in violent storms. The magnetic energy, as developed in the mariner's needle, is, as all know, essentially one with the electricity beheld in heaven. Hence it is not to be much marvelled at that such things should be. Instances where the lightning has actually struck the vessel, so as to smite down some of these spars and rigging, the effect upon the needle has at times been still more fatal, all its lodestone virtue being annihilated, so that the before magnetic steel was of no more use than an old wife's knitting needle. But in either case the needle never again of itself recovers the original virtue thus marred or lost, and if the binnacle compasses be affected, the same fate reaches all the others that may be in the ship, even were the lowermost one inserted into the kelson. Deliberately standing before the binnacle, and eyeing the transpointed compasses, the old man, with the sharp of his extended hand, now took the precise bearing of the sun, and, satisfied that the needles were exactly inverted, shouted out his orders for the ship's course to be changed accordingly. The yards were hard up, and once more the Pequod thrust her undaunted bows into the opposing wind, for the supposed fair one had only been juggling her. Meanwhile, whatever were his own secret thoughts, Starbuck said nothing, but quietly he issued all requisite orders, while Stubb and Flask, who in some small degree seemed then to be sharing his feelings, likewise unmurmuringly acquiesced. 
As for the men, though some of them lowly rumbled, their fear of Ahab was greater than their fear of fate. But as ever before, the pagan harpooners remained almost wholly unimpressed, or, if impressed, it was only with a certain magnetism shot into their congenial hearts from inflexible Ahabs. For a space the old man walked the deck in rolling reveries, but chancing to slip with his ivory heel, he saw the crushed copper sight-tubes of the quadrant he had the day before dashed to the deck. "'Thou poor, proud heaven-gazer and sun's pilot! Yesterday I wrecked thee, and to-day the compasses would fain have wrecked me. So, so. But Ahab is lord over the level lodestone yet. Mr. Starbuck, a lance without a pole, a top maul, and the smallest of the sailmaker's needles. Quick! Accessory, perhaps, to the impulse dictating the thing he was now about to do, were certain prudential motives, whose object might have been to revive the spirits of his crew by a stroke of his subtle skill, in a matter so wondrous as that of the inverted compasses. Besides, the old man well knew that to steer by transpointed needles, though clumsily practicable, was not a thing to be passed over by superstitious sailors without some shudderings and evil portents. Men, said he, steadily turning upon the crew, as the mate handed him the things he had demanded. My men, the thunder turned old Ahab's needles, but out of this bit of steel Ahab can make one of his own that will point as true as any. Abashed glances of servile wonder were exchanged by the sailors as this was said, and with fascinated eyes they awaited whatever magic might follow. But Starbuck looked away. With a blow from the top maul, Ahab knocked off the steel head of the lance, and then, handing to the mate the long iron rod remaining, bade him hold it upright, without its touching the deck. Then, with the maul, after repeatedly smiting the upper end of this iron rod, he placed the blunted needle endwise on top of it, and less strongly hammered that, several times, the mate still holding the rod as before. Then, going through some small strange motions with it, whether indispensable to the magnetizing of the steel, or merely intended to augment the awe of the crew is uncertain, he called for linen thread and moving to the binnacle, slipped out the two reverse needles there, and horizontally suspended the sail-needle by its middle, over one of the compass cards. At first the steel went round and round, quivering and vibrating at either end, but at last it settled to its place, when Ahab, who had been intently watching for this result, stepped frankly back from the binnacle, and, pointing his stretched arm towards it, exclaimed, Look ye for yourselves, if Ahab be not lord of the level lodestone. The sun is east, and that compass swears it. One after another they peered in, for nothing but their own eyes could persuade such ignorance as theirs, and one after another they slunk away. In his fiery eyes of scorn and triumph, you then saw Ahab in all his fatal pride. Chapter 125. The Log and Line While now the fated Pequod had been so long afloat this voyage, the log and line had but very seldom been in use. Owing to a confident reliance on other means of determining the vessel's place, some merchantmen and many whalemen, especially when cruising, wholly neglect to heave the log though at the same time, and frequently more for form's sake than anything else, regularly putting down upon the customary slate the course steered by the ship, as well as the presumed average rate of progression every hour. It had thus been with the Pequod. The wooden reel, an angular log attached, hung long untouched just beneath the railing of the after bulwarks. Rains and spray had damped it, sun and wind had warped it, all the elements had combined to rot a thing that hung so idly. But heedless of all this, his mood seized Ahab, as he happened to glance upon the reel, not many hours after the magnet scene, and he remembered how his quadrant was no more, and recalled his frantic oath about the level log and line. 
the ship was sailing plungingly, astern the billows rolled in riots. Forward there! Heave the log! Two seamen came, the golden-hued Tahitian and the grisly Manxman. Take the reel, one of ye. I'll heave. They went towards the extreme stern on the ship's lee side, where the deck, with the oblique energy of the wind, was now almost dipping into the creamy, sidelong rushing sea. The manxman took the reel, and holding it high up by the projecting handle-ends of the spindle, round which the spool of line revolved, so stood with the angular log hanging downwards, till Ahab advanced to him. Ahab stood before him, and was lightly unwinding some thirty or forty turns to form a preliminary hand-coil to toss overboard, when the old manxman, who was intently eyeing both him and the line, made bold to speak. "'Sir, I mistrust it. This line looks far gone. Long heat and wet have spoiled it.' "'Twill hold, old gentleman. Long heat and wet. Have they spoiled thee? Thou seems to hold. Or truer, perhaps, life holds thee, not thou it.' "'I hold the spool, sir. But just as my captain says, "'With these grey hairs of mine tis not worth while disputing.' especially with a superior who'll ne'er confess. What's that? There now's a patched professor in Queen Nature's granite-founded college, but methinks he's too subservient. Where wert thou born? In the little rocky isle of man, sir. Excellent! Thou'st hit the world by that. I know not, sir, but I was born there. In the isle of man, hey? Well, the other way, it's good. Here's a man from man, a man born in once independent man, and now unmanned of man, which is sucked in. By what? Up with the reel. The dead blind wall butts all inquiring heads at last. Up with it. So. The log was heaved. The loose coils rapidly straightened out in a long, dragging line astern, and then, instantly, the reel began to whirl. In turns, jerkingly raised and lowered by the rolling billows, the towing resistance of the log caused the old reelman to stagger strangely. "'Hold hard!' Snap! The overstrained line sagged down in one long festoon. The tugging log was gone. I crush the quadrant. The thunder turns the needles, and now the mad sea parts the log line. But Ahab can mend all. Haul in there, Tahitian. Reel up, Manxman. And look ye, let the carpenter make another log, and mend thou the line. See to it. There he goes now. To him nothing's happened, but to me the skewer seems loosening out of the middle of the world. All in, all in, Tahitian. These lines run whole and whirling out, come in broken and dragging slow. Ha! Pip! Come to help, eh, Pip? Pip! Whom call ye Pip? Pip jumped from the whale-boat. Pip's missing. Let's see now if you haven't fished him up here, fisherman. It drags hard. I guess he's holding on. Jerk him, Tahiti. Jerk him off. We haul in no cowards here. Ho! Oh, there's his arm just breaking water. A hatchet! A hatchet! Cut it off! We haul in no cowards here. Captain Ahab, sir, sir, here's Pip trying to get on board again. Peace, thou crazy loon! cried the manxman, seizing him by the arm. Away from the quarter-deck! The greater idiot ever scolds the lesser, muttered Ahab, advancing. Hands off from that holiness. Where sayest thou Pip was, boy? Astern there, sir, astern. Lo, lo. And who art thou, boy? I see not my reflection in the vacant pupils of thy eyes. O oh, God, that man should be a thing for immortal souls to sieve through. Who art thou, boy? Bellboy, sir. Ship's crier. Ding, dong, ding, pip, 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 one hundred pounds of clay reward for pip, 
five feet high, looks cowardly, quickest known by that. Ding, dong, ding, who's seen Pip, the coward? There can be no hearts above the snow line. Oh, ye frozen heavens, look down here. Ye did beget this luckless child, and have abandoned him, ye creative libertines. Here, boy, Ahab's cabin shall be Pip's home henceforth, while Ahab lives. Thou touchest my innermost center, boy. Thou art tied to me by cords woven of my heart-strings. Come, let's down. What's this? Here's velvet shark-skin. Intently gazing at Ahab's hand and feeling it. Ah, now, had poor Pip but felt so kind a thing as this, perhaps he had ne'er been lost. This seems to me, sir, as a man-rope, something that weak souls may hold by. Oh, sir, let old Perth now come and rivet these two hands together, the black one with the white, for I will not let this go. Oh, boy, nor will I thee, unless I should thereby drag thee to worse horrors than are here. Come, then, to my cabin. Lo, ye believers in God's all goodness, and in man all ill, lo, you, see the omniscient gods oblivious of suffering man and man, though idiotic, and knowing not what he does, yet full of the sweet things of love and gratitude. Come, I feel prouder leading thee by thy black hand than though I had grasped an emperor's. There go two daft ones now, muttered the old manxman, one daft with strength, the other daft with weakness. But here's the end of the rotten line, all dripping, too. Mend it, eh? I think we had best have a new line altogether. I'll see Mr. Stubb about it. Chapter 126 The Life Boy Steering now southeastward by Ahab's leveled steel, and her progress solely determined by Ahab's level log and line, the Pequod held on her path towards the equator making so long a passage through such unfrequented waters, descrying no ships, and ere long sideways impelled by unvarying trade winds, over waves monotonously mild, all these seemed the strange calm things preluding some riotous and desperate scene. At last, when the ship drew near to the outskirts, as it were, of the equatorial fishing ground, and in the deep darkness that goes before the dawn was sailing by a cluster of rocky islets, the watch, then headed by Flask, was startled by a cry so plaintively wild and unearthly, like half-articulated wailings of the ghosts of all Herod's murdered innocents, that one and all they started from their reveries, and for the space of some moments stood, or sat, or leaned all transfixedly listening, like the carved Roman slave, while that wild cry remained within hearing. The Christian or civilized part of the crew said it was mermaids and shuddered, but the pagan harpooners remained unappalled. Yet the grey manxman, the oldest mariner of all, declared that the wild thrilling sounds that were heard were the voices of newly drowned men in the sea. Below, in his hammock, Ahab did not hear of this till grey dawn, when he came to the deck. It was then recounted to him by Flask, not unaccompanied with hinted dark meanings. He hollowly laughed, and thus explained the wonder. Those rocky islands the ship had passed were the resort of great numbers of seals, and some young seals that had lost their dams, or some dams that had lost their cubs, must have risen nigh the ship and kept company with her, crying and sobbing with their human sort of wail. But this only the more affected some of them, because most mariners cherish a very superstitious feeling about seals, arising not only from their peculiar tones when in distress, but also from the human look of their round heads and semi-intelligent faces, seen peeringly uprising from the water alongside. In the sea, under certain circumstances, seals have more than once been mistaken for men. But the bodings of the crew were destined to receive a most plausible confirmation in the fate of one of their number that morning. 
At sunrise, this man went from his hammock to the masthead at the fore, and whether it was that he had not yet half waked from his sleep, for sailors sometimes go aloft in a transition state, whether it was thus with the man, there is now no telling, but be that as it may, he had not been long at his perch when a cry was heard, a cry and a rushing, and looking up they saw a falling phantom in the air, and looking down, a little tossed heap of white bubbles in the blue of the sea. The life-boy, a long, slender cask, was dropped from the stern, where it always hung obedient to a cunning spring, but no hand rose to seize it, and the sun having long beat upon this cask, it had shrunken, so that it slowly filled, and that parched wood also filled at its every pore, and the studded, iron-bound cask followed the sailor to the bottom, as if to yield him his pillow, though in sooth but a hard one. And thus the first man of the Pequod that mounted the mast to look out for the white whale, on the white whale's own peculiar ground, that man was swallowed up in the deep. But few perhaps thought of that at the time. Indeed, in some sort they were not grieved at this event, at least as a portent, for they regarded it not as a foreshadowing of evil in the future, but as the fulfillment of an evil already presaged. They declared that now they knew the reason of those wild shrieks they had heard the night before. But again the old Manxman said nay. The lost life-boy was now to be replaced. Starbuck was directed to see to it. But as no cask of sufficient lightness could be found, and as in the feverish eagerness of what seemed the approaching crisis of the voyage, all hands were impatient of any toil but what was directly connected with its final end, whatever that might prove to be, therefore they were going to leave the ship's stern unprovided with a boy, when by certain strange signs and innuendos, Queequeg hinted a hint concerning his coffin. "'A life-boy of a coffin!' cried Starbuck, starting. "'Rather queer, that, I should say,' said Stubb. "'It'll make a good enough one,' said Flask. "'The carpenter here can arrange it easily.' "'Bring it up. There's nothing else for it,' said Starbuck, after a melancholy pause. "'Rig it, carpenter. Do not look at me so. The coffin, I mean. Dost thou hear me? Rig it.' "'And shall I uh, nail down the lid, sir?' moving his hand as with a hammer. Aye, and shall I uh, caulk the seams, sir, moving his hand as with a caulking iron? Aye, and shall I then pay over the same with uh, pitch, sir, moving his hand as with a pitch-pot? Away! What possesses thee to this? Make a life-boy of the coffin, and no more. Mr. Stubb, Mr. Flask, come forward with me. Off he goes in a huff. The whole he can endure, at the parts he balks. Now I don't like this. I make a leg for Captain Ahab, and he wears it like a gentleman. But I make a bandbox for Queequeg, and he won't put his head into it. Are all my pains to go for nothing with that coffin? And now I'm ordered to make a life-boy of it. It's like turning an old coat, going to bring the flesh on the other side now. I don't like this cobbling sort of business." I don't like it at all. It's undignified. It's not my place. Let tinkers' brats do tinkerings. We are their betters. I like to take in hand none but clean, virgin, fair, and square mathematical jobs, something that regularly begins at the beginning, and is at the middle when midway, and comes to an end at the uh, conclusion. Not a cobbler's job that's at an end in the middle and at the beginning at the end. It's the old woman's tricks to be giving cobbling jobs. Lord, what an affection all women have for tinkers. I know an old woman of sixty-five who ran away with a bald-headed young tinker once, and that's the reason I never would work for lonely widow old women ashore when I kept my job shop in the vineyards. They might have taken it into their lonely old heads to run off with me. But hi-ho! There are no caps at sea but snow-caps. Let me see. Nail down the lid. Caulk the seams. Pay over the same with pitch. Batten them down tight. 
and hang it with the snap-spring over the ship's stern. Were ever such things done before with a coffin? Some superstitious old carpenters now would be tied up in the rigging ere they would do the job. But I'm made of knotty aroostook hemlock. I don't budge. Cruppered with a coffin, sailing about with a graveyard tray. But never mind. We workers in woods make bridal bedsteads and card tables, as well as coffins and hearses. We work by the month, or by the job, or by the profit. Not for us to ask the why and wherefore of our work, unless it be too confounded cobbling. Then we stash it if we can. Hem. I'll do the job now, tenderly. I'll have me... let's see. How many in the ship's company, all told? But I've forgotten. Anyway, I'll have me thirty separate Turks-headed lifelines, each three feet long, hanging all round the coffin. Then, if the hull go down, there'll be thirty lively fellows all fighting for one coffin, a sight not seen very often beneath the sun. <laughs> Come, hammer, caulking iron, pitch pot, and marling spike. Let's to it. Chapter 127 The Deck The coffin laid upon two line-tubs, between the vice-bench and the open hatchway, the carpenter caulking its seams, the string of twisted oakum slowly unwinding from a large roll of it, placed in the bosom of his frock. Ahab comes slowly from the cabin gangway, and hears Pip following him. "'Back, lad. I will be with you again presently.' He goes. "'Not this hand complies with my humour more genially than that boy. "'Middle aisle of a church. What's here?' "'A life-boy, sir. Mr. Starbuck's orders. "'Oh, look, sir, beware the hatchway.' "'Thank ye, man. Thy coffin lies handy to the vault.' "'Sir? Oh, the hatchway. Oh, uh, so it does, sir, uh, so it does.' "'Art thou not the leg-maker? Look, did not this stump come from thy shop?' "'I believe it did, sir. Does the ferrule stand, sir?' "'Well enough. But art thou not also the undertaker?' "'Ay, sir. I patched up this thing here as a coffin for Queequeg, but they've set me now to turning it into something else.' "'Then tell me, art thou not an errant, all-grasping, intermeddling, monopolizing, heathenish old scamp, to be one day making legs, and the next day coffins to clap them in?' and yet again life-boys out of those same coffins. Thou art as unprincipled as the gods, and as much of a jack of all trades. But I do not mean anything, sir. I do as I do. The gods again. Hark ye! Dost thou not ever sing working about a coffin? The titans, they say, hummed snatches when chipping out the craters for volcanoes and the grave-digger in the play sings, spade in hand. Dost thou never? Sing, sir. Do I sing? Oh, I'm indifferent enough, sir, for that. But the reason why the grave-digger made music must have been because there was none in his spade, sir. But the caulking mallet is full of it. Hark to it. Aye, and that's because the lid there's a sounding-board. And what in all things makes the sounding-board is this. There's naught beneath. And yet a coffin with a body in it rings pretty much the same, Carpenter. Hast thou ever helped carry a beer, and heard the coffin knock against the churchyard gate going in? Faith, sir, I... Faith! What's that? Why, faith, sir, it's only a sort of exclamation-like. That's all, sir. Uh, hmm. Go on. I was about to say, sir, that art thou a silkworm? Dost thou spin thy own shroud out of thyself? Look at thy bosom. Dispatch and get these traps out of sight. He goes aft. That was sudden now, but squalls come sudden in hot latitudes. I've heard that the Isle of Albemarle, 
one of the Galapagos, is cut by the equator right in the middle. It seems to me some sort of equator cuts yon old man, too, right in his middle. He's always under the line. Fiery hot, I tell you. He's looking this way. Come, Oakum, quick. Here we go again. This wooden mallet is the cork, and I'm the professor of musical glasses. Tap, tap. Ahab to himself. There's a sight. There's a sound. The gray-headed woodpecker tapping the hollow tree. Blind and dumb might well be envied now. See, that thing rests on two line tubs full of tow lines. A most malicious wag, that fellow. Rat, tat, so man's seconds tick. Oh, how immaterial are all materials! What things real are there but imponderable thoughts? Here now's the very dreaded symbol of grim death, by a mere hap, made the expressive sign of the help and hope of most endangered life. A life-boy of a coffin. Does it go further? Can it be that in some spiritual sense, the coffin is, after all, but an immortality preserver? I'll think of that. But no, so far gone am I in the dark side of earth, that its other side, the theoretic bright one, seems but uncertain twilight to me. Will you never have done, Carpenter, with that accursed sound? I go below. Let me not see that thing here when I return again. Now then, Pip, we'll talk this over. I do suck most wondrous philosophies from thee. Some unknown conduits from the unknown worlds must empty into thee. End of chapters 124 to 127